What people group are we talking about? It's the children's, man. The children's. Roll, the, roll all those slides. All those slides. Oh, my goodness. What a cutie. Keep, just keep going. Blues Brothers, keep going. Just go through all of them. Oh, so cute. Go for another one. Just keep going. This is the Peter Slideshow. You can roll them pretty fast. Maybe some technical difficulties. Hey, there's a good one, too. Man, he's, oh, look at that. Man, what a guy. What a guy. Oh, whoa. But y'all forgot about that one. And then here's the last one. Oh, yeah. Made that touchdown. Whoa, what, what a football player. So that's Hannah and myself's son, Peter. He's the bomb. We love him so much. Uh, he wasn't, don't worry, we're not, like, making him a photo prop or anything. He was having a great time in that photo. He was just, he's like, I just want to get a touchdown, Dad. And we're like, all right, let's do it. So we're talking about children. We love children. Most of the time, they're awesome. And there's something very special about kids. This is our first child. He's 13 months old. And the very awesome thing when he was born was he's the first person in the whole world that Hannah and I did not have to choose to love. He just came out. It's like, I love this guy. Did not have to choose. It was awesome. Now we definitely have to choose multiple times a day. But when he came out, it's like, man, this, I love this kid. He's awesome. So it was, it's just something special about children. They're full of wonder. They're full of innocence. They're full of joy. They laugh all the time. And uh, our friend Paul Brown one time told me before Peter was born that, man, when you have kids, you're not really going to watch TV anymore. I was like, all right, whatever. Uh, I was like, maybe that's true, maybe not. But now I can definitely say that is true in our lives. I'll find myself for 20 minutes at a time just staring at Peter, explore life and explore the world and just watch him live. It's kind of like having like a cat, but like a really awesome like, that's a, alive, that's like human, so it's like a very advanced animal. That's a terrible way to describe our kid. You know what I'm saying. It's like a creature in your house. It's like, this is so fascinating. This guy is awesome. So I just spent, you know, the other day he spent like four hours playing with these two, two red solo cups. He just pick them up and throw them. And he threw them for probably 50 times. And every time there was a genuine laugh that came out of his mouth when he threw them on the floor. 50 times in a row. It's like, this kid is awesome. He loves cups. He doesn't need toys. So our world, they adore little kids. And my wife, Hannah, can tell you that bringing a baby in public is the same as wearing a T-shirt that says, creepy strangers, please talk to me. Because it just invites everyone. Everyone feels like they like, are friends with you, which is cool. Opens up some cool conversations. But her random interactions have been hilarious but also concerning. And we know that people, they make Instagram accounts about their children. They post everything that they do, every little step. Every little time they eat something, uh, there's a lot of, there's a million milestones to document when they're growing up because there's something new every single day, and it's awesome. So there's something about kids that just intrigues people. They're very fascinating things. And this rings true in America for the most part, but this has not always been the case that children are intriguing. They have not always been held in the highest esteem. And historically, they were not loved by the public or admired really for any reason at all. And we're going to talk about Jesus' time during the reign of King Herod when Jesus was born. Now, Jesus' circumstances were not admirable by any means. He was born without dignity in, you know, in a room with animals, not a palace. Uh, he was known as a mamzer child, a child born uh, for two parents who were not married so it was kind of frowned upon. Mary had to carry a lot of shame when people didn't understand, no, this is the Messiah. You'll see eventually. But she carried a lot of shame. Um, so he was not born with dignity. He would have been one of the outcast children. And there's something about this Jesus that even on his first day, he had a way of forcing people to make a decision about, is this guy good or is he not so good? Because when he was born, word got around that a king has been born in the land of Herod. And Herod, being the paranoid dictator he is, he decrees that every male two years and below will be killed. The whole town, his own subjects, he kills every two-year-old boy in the whole place. And this wicked government decreed that children were disposable. And I submit to you that this attitude reflected the culture at large, not just King Herod. Because in the ancient status-ordered world, children were at the very bottom of the barrel of society. And what's funny is in both Greek and Latin, the word for children used back then actually meant not speaking. Because children, you're not supposed to speak. You're not an adult. You have nothing good to say. They lacked the dignity of reason. 
To be a child was to be dependent, fragile, defenseless, at risk, and essentially useless until you grew up, grew big enough to like carry something, carry a bucket of water, or be productive. They were seen as kind of useless. But the good news is Jesus' ministry began to change everything. He changed a lot of stuff, and he changed this as well. He spent time with the social outcasts, the obvious sinners, and little children instead of with the righteous people, and we're glad for that. But if you're a legalistic church kid like me, where are you people at? I know there's a ton of you in here. I'm so glad we got saved. If you're a legalistic church kid like me, Jesus would not have hung out with us if we were around him. I'd be like, oh, this would be me talking to Jesus. Oh, hey, Jesus, how's it going? Oh, how am I doing? I'm doing great. I'm pretty tired because I've been fasting for two weeks and praying constantly. I'm so tired. Thanks for asking, though. And he would have said, Matt, you're like a beautiful coffin. You're beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of death and bones. And he would have walked away. And that would have been the thing I needed to hear. And that's what he pretty much told me in my testimony. It's awesome. But he would not have hung out with the legalistic people, with the righteous people. He showed us by his actions, by hanging out with sinners, that everyone has eternal value. Praise God. Jesus treated each person like they were made in the image of God. And this disrupted every single caste system ever made by man. This disrupted all the social, cultural norms that man constructed. And the effects of this God way of thinking trickled all the way down over 1,700 years to America. You say, yeah, they did. Trickled down all the way to the United States Declaration of Independence when we told King George to get out of here. This is what's stated in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So we've heard that before in history class. The, Americas, the American forefathers claimed that all were made in God's image and thus all men were equal. And that trickles down from what Jesus was teaching. And this biblical truth fueled the abolitionist movement and it later convicted the very people that wrote it because they had slaves. They were like, yes, they are equal, so we've got to do something about that. So as Americans, this is very familiar rhetoric to us. We've heard the Declaration. We're like, big deal. But this was a big deal in history. Go back to Jesus' time. No one thought men were created equal. The great thinker Aristotle did not think that. He wrote that inequality, having masters and having slaves, was the natural order of things. It wasn't only natural, but it was actually healthy for society to be that way. But we as Christians know every human is made in the child or is made in the image of God and is a child of the king. However, the ancient world, they were way off the mark. So talking about Jesus' time, many babies did not even survive, not just because mortality rate, but because unwanted children were often just left to die. And this was a practice called exposure. They would leave them outside, exposed to the elements, and they'd pass away. And the crazy thing is the head of the household had the legal right to decide which kid lives, which kid doesn't live. And he had about eight days to decide, should this kid live, should he not? Now, a few reasons um, that children were left because the family, maybe they didn't want to divide up their estate. If they're a wealthy family, if they're a poor family, they just realize we can't afford this child. They leave him outside. Um, if they're the wrong gender, meaning there was a girl child, they did not want a girl because that can't be an heir. So they left the kid outside. So Jesus was this kid, he was in this category that he would not have survived if Joseph was Roman. He was born out of wedlock. That was a shameful thing, and he would have been cast away. And the kids were often left just in piles of garbage. Sometimes they were rescued, but usually by slave traders to traffic them. Babies that were disabled or appeared weak were often disposed of by drowning. And an ancient Roman law said that a boy who was strikingly deformed had to be disposed of quickly. So this culture that Jesus was born into deemed children disposable. But once Jesus began his public ministry, a lot of things began to change. And Jesus did not just tolerate the culture, but he began to fight against this wicked culture. So we're going to look at two instances in which Jesus elevated children in the Bible. You can turn to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. So this is the first instance. It will be on the screens also. Yes. So Matthew 18, starting in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you convert and become like little children, 
you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And we just dropped the mic right there. That's a revolutionary phrase. I know if you're in church, you've read that before, but that is a revolutionary statement. No one else in the ancient world used children as an example of holiness or really anything good. This teaching would have been incredibly offensive to the original audience. Our friend G.K. Chesterton writes concerning this, he says, The pagan world as such would not have understood any such thing as a serious suggestion that a child is higher or holier than a man. It would have seemed like the suggestion that a tadpole is higher or holier than a frog. He's saying, this is not logical. <laughs> the child is like a mini form of a grown man. They can't do anything. But Jesus said otherwise. And the elevation of childhood came into the world through Christ. And even where belief in Jesus has declined, the elevation of childhood has remained. It's left a mark on society. So to make this a little more real for us, this situation, this verse, imagine you've been following Jesus around faithfully for three years. And you've given up everything. You dropped out of college. Your family, you gave them up, you left. You left all your property that you're going to get from your dad. You left your steady income. You left prospects of a spouse unless someone you found liked that you were homeless with Jesus, if that was like a good thing for them. Probably no spouse in the picture. And you're following this guy around, Jesus, and you ask him, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And what would you, asking that question, expect the answer to be? Be like, Jesus, like, I'm the greatest, right? I mean, I am going to be in the Bible one day, so it's pretty, it's got to be one of us. So the disciples come to Jesus after arguing among themselves about who is the greatest. And I can only imagine they assumed one of the greatest was in their group. It had to be one of the 12 guys. It's like, this is the son of God. He picked us. It's got to be one of us. So they're bickering among themselves. They're like, well, you know, I did this. I've seen this miracle. Oh, but whoa, whoa. Last year, Jesus told me this thing, and it was a parable I understood. Or like, no, I saw this miracle and this deliverance. And they're kind of weighing all their experiences and what they've seen and done. And they make their case. And finally, they're not getting anywhere because no one's budging and admitting that someone else is the greatest. They all want to be the greatest. So they come to Jesus. They say, Jesus, you settle this. We can't figure out which one of us is the greatest. So just tell us. We trust you. And instead of picking one of the 12 disciples, Jesus calls a little kid. He says, hey, come here. A little kid comes up. He picks him up. And he says, this child and all people like him are the greatest in my kingdom. And unless you are converted and become like this child, you will by no means enter my kingdom. Now, converted can be a strange word in this context, but it's the Greek word for turning, like turning, like turning the other cheek. Um, and it means in this way to turn oneself or to turn and change your mind. And the cool thing is the Greek word for repentance, which is metanoia, literally means to change one's mind because repentance is a true change of mind. So essentially Jesus is saying here, you need to repent and become like this child. That's a tall order because who is the audience that he's talking to? Who is it? The disciples. Is there anyone, is this like a Sermon on the Mount moment? Is he like talking to 5,000 people? No, it says his disciples came up to Jesus. So it's just them. There might be a couple eavesdroppers, but he's talking to his disciples. And he says to them, unless you disciples are converted, you will by no means enter my kingdom. This means the disciples, they were not doing so hot. It had been about two, two and a half years. They weren't really getting it. They still needed to be transformed. And the crazy thing is that the disciples, they had done a lot. They had done so much ministry with Jesus. They had accomplished much. And in contrast, this little kid that Jesus calls over is probably maybe two to five years old. What has that kid done for the kingdom of God? He's not out there preaching. He's just being a kid. But Jesus says, this kid, this is the answer. So why is this significant? Imagine going to your small group and you and your 11 friends You've been having an awesome two years in small group. You've been casting out demons. You've been seeing people healed. One of you even walked on water at one point. That would be an awesome small group experience. That would be awesome. And then you guys go to your leader and you meet up and he says, hey, y'all need to repent. And you're kind of like, man, we've had a, we've been killing it. This guy, walked, my friend walked on water. 
What are you talking about? What does this mean for us? Jesus is showing us here that our works cannot save us. Praise God. That would be a crushing weight. Our works cannot save us. So to the Christians, I say to us, let us beware of assuming our good standing with God based on works. Paul in Philippians tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. I pray that none in this room will hear this, but at death, many who thought they were saved will hear out of Jesus' mouth face to face, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who make a habit of breaking my laws. And to those of you resisting Jesus tonight, or to those of you who do not think he's real, if you don't surrender your life to Jesus tonight, These scriptures will act as a witness testifying against you on the day that you meet Jesus face to face for your judgment. Because you cannot be saved by association. You cannot be saved by assimilation. It is your individual choice. And you'll either live by that choice forever or you will die by that choice forever. So Jesus' word to us tonight to this group of mature, responsible, independent students is this. Children do not need to grow up and become like us. We need to grow down and become like them. You should write that down. Children do not need to grow up and become like us students. We need to grow down and become like they are. Because Jesus says so. So that's the first instance. The second instance of Jesus elevating childhood is found in Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. I'll give you a minute to turn there. It will be on the screen also. So this is the Gospel of Luke. This is what it says, verse 15. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Wow, that's another revolutionary statement. This also would have been very offensive to the first century hearers. So remember that last time you went to the Huntsville movie theater, go to go see a movie, and there's that group of sibling kids in front of you that just won't be quiet. They're just fighting the whole time. You're like, where'd Brian get an icy? I want an icy. Hey, where'd you get candy, mom? Why'd he get candy? I didn't get candy. You're like, get off my armrest. He's like, stop touching me. And this is like the whole movie. And you're just like, come on, kids. Like, just get it together. This this movie's great. You're ruining the experience. I know it's only $3, but you're ruining it. (laughs) Or remember those times on an airplane, and there's that baby that just won't stop crying the whole time, especially on an international flight. Now, I've been on both sides these days, and I have very much compassion for the other side. So you should, too, have compassion. But by nature, kids are loud. They're rambunctious. They're incredibly distracting. If Peter was out here, he'd just be stealing all your phones the whole time. But imagine, put yourself in the disciples' shoes. You're listening to Jesus preach incredible, world-changing things, and people with babies are elbowing their way through the crowd. Probably moms, because they, they get it more than guys do. They're elbowing their way through the crowd to get Jesus to bless their kids. That's awesome. But Jesus is in the middle of a teaching. And now babies are crying, they're spitting up everywhere, they're defecating on themselves in the midst of this teaching session. I'm not sure what diapers were like back then. But it's a distraction. And you're trying to listen to Jesus. In your mind, you're like, lady, get that baby out of here. I'm trying to listen to Jesus. Do you not understand this is important? I can't believe you brought a baby here. This is the worst place for a kid. And people are looking around like, what's that commotion? Like when there's a sound, everyone's like, what? And they turn their attention away. So if it happens, just keep your eyes right here. I'll let you know if anything is going on over there. But the disciples see this commotion and they're like, man, we don't want Jesus' sermon to flop. We got to do something. So <laughs> they go up to the parents before they get to Jesus. They're like, hey, get these kids. You can't bring a baby over here. Like, go, go back. When he's done, maybe he'll come see your kid. Like, go, go away. And he sent, they rebuke, it says they rebuke the parents. That's a very strong word. They're like, you're a sinner. Get away from here. <laughs> but then Jesus stops everything. He stops talking. He says, bring those babies over here. Like, bring the baby to me. Why did he say that? He says, for the kingdom of God belongs to these children, to people like this. That's crazy. In the ancient world, 
There were plenty of clubs and organizations, but there were none for children. But here in this verse, Jesus reveals a kingdom for children, 2,000 years before Walt Disney did his thing. And little children came in the New Testament, and as the Jesus movement spread, it created a community for children. In early church doctrine, the apostles, they prohibited the widespread practices of exposure, of abortion, and of killing infants because they're either unwanted or they can't support them. And back then, the average life expectancy was about 30 years of age. This means the world was full of orphans. But now, after Jesus, for the first time, a community, the church, began to collect money to support these orphans. And at baptism, children would receive godparents. That way, if their parents die, the godparents would take care of the kids. And by the late 4th century, a Christian emperor outlawed the practice of exposure for the entire Roman Empire. And over time, instead of leaving unwanted babies in a trash pile, people began to leave them outside of church. The beginnings of what would be known as orphanages began to rise because of what Jesus did. Jesus wants the unwanted children. 2,000 years ago, he began a movement that still affects the world. He gave us, the church, the responsibility to be the welfare for society, to take care of the widows, take care of the orphans, the outcasts, the poor. This is our responsibility. He fought the cultural belief that children were disposable. He said instead they are indisposable, that we as Christians need children because unless we receive the kingdom of God like they do, there's no way we're going to enter it. So now I'm going to invite my wife Hannah up here, and she's going to walk us through why Jesus used children and how we can become more like them. This is kind of tall, <laughs> but it's all right. It's totally fine. Okay, so why uh, did Jesus give much weight to children? All right, so do you think that Jesus would have used this kid? Let's see. Look at those legs. But I'm pretty sure if this kid would have walked by, Jesus would have said, okay, that's the greatest kid. There's another one. <laughs> that is the greatest kid, right? Yes, just kidding. Doesn't it look like Peter with pigtails? It's awesome. Just kidding. So kids really are amazing. Our friend uh, Eli and Mandy Stewart, uh, they have a son named Shane. And when Shane was in first grade, he'd come home from school, and Mandy would look through his bag to see if he had any homework. And she noticed that he started to bring his Bible to school. And so she's like, Shane, this is wonderful that you want to bring your Bible to school. What, what made you want to do that? And he just says, well, Mom, I, I share about Jesus at lunchtime. And once Shane learned about who Jesus was and what he had done for his life, he could not help but tell his friends. So once children learn something, they believe it, and then they obey it. Children are forgiving. They're trusting. They know how much we need to learn. They live in a world of right and wrong. They're full of joy, full of faith and love. They're fresh every morning. They look at everything like it's never been looked at before. They're simple and direct, and at the end of the day, they just relax. <laughs> so unless we convert and become like children, Jesus says we will not enter God's kingdom. So how do we do it? So yesterday, as I was trying to prepare for this, Peter was playing with this ottoman um, in our house. And the day consisted of him wanting me to put him in the box, and then I'd walk away five seconds later, he'd scream, take me out of the box. This was all day long. Put me in the box, take me out of the box. Put me in the box, take me out of the box. He wanted water, he wanted milk, he wanted goldfish, but then he only wanted three goldfish. So then he wanted a spoonful of yogurt, and then he needed his diaper changed. He wanted to turn the light switch on and off on and off. This was the entire day, hours of this. He'd pull up my leg as I sat at the table. He'd point and he'd grunt until, like, it was basically all day long I was playing hot or cold. Am I, what, what are we doing? You know, this is, okay. And so my patience was becoming thinner and weaker as the day went on, and I just kept saying, I can't pick you up. I, I have to work on this. I can't do that. I'd grumble and I'd complain as we flipped through run, spot, run for the 100th time. But Peter finally went to sleep, and I just kept thinking, like, I couldn't get anything done. It's 9 p.m., and we are supposed to preach tomorrow, and I have done nothing today uh, because Peter needed me all day long. And then the Lord spoke so clearly to me, and he said, I delight to be your source and your constant supply. The dependency of others in your life is draining because you're finite, but he desires for us to be dependent on him. He delights to carry us to hold us together, to give us breath, and to provide constant care. 
So thank you, Jesus, that you aren't helping us but under your breath saying, you know, this is not that important. I actually have the world to take care of. Um, could you do this on your own? Could you supply your own needs because I, I just don't have time? Children are dependent for every aspect of their life. So I don't know a better passage of scripture to help us know how to live a life of reliance on Jesus than John 15. So Jesus was just hours away from crucifixion, and everything was about to change radically for the disciples. Jesus was going to die and then rise again and then leave them and ascend to the Father and send his Holy Spirit to help them carry out his great mission. Um, they had to learn to depend on him for everything, um, but now they would have to learn to depend on him for everything without him physically being present. This is us today. So we'll just start. We're just going to read um, the first five verses in John 15. It starts with, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So the chapter goes on, and I encourage you to read it tomorrow. It's so incredible. But these verses have numerous implications uh, for our life. And we could literally spend weeks unpacking what Jesus said in these few sentences. But he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So the word nothing in the Greek is this word, ooh, which means nothing. Thank you. Wonderful. So you can do nothing, all right? If you think about it, vine branches don't have to try to abide in the vine. They just do. Uh, the only way they can become detached is if someone or something detaches them. But not with us, obviously, because he had to tell us to stay in the vine. So there is this ongoing tension in our lives, that of continually needing God's help, even when we continually resent it or are reluctant to accept it. So we say, Jesus... I can't do as much without you, but I really can do a lot on my own. I'm not going to die if I don't read my Bible today or spend time praying. I go to small group. I, I, I come to Chi Alpha. I think I'm doing all right. But then in the very same breath, as we believe our, our lives are dependent on us, we complain because we're tired and heavy laden as we carry the responsibilities of being in charge of our own lives. So have you ever watched a four-year-old make macaroni and cheese? Have we seen this before? So let's, you know, by the time they're four, they are saying, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, you know? Um, so they can most likely get the pot, but then if they were to be able to get up on a stool and fill the pot with water, okay, that's great. But then imagine them trying to get down and then go to the stove, okay? So let's say they successfully... Um, get water, and then they imagine this scene with me. Then they try to find another stool to get up onto the stove, to put the pot on the stove, to turn it on. You understand what I'm saying? To, then they have to, how do they know uh, when does it boil? When do you add the noodles? Okay, let's say they do all of this, all right? So um, when do the noodles, when are they ready? When do they need to be drained? Then you get back down off the stool, then you get back to the sink and then you drain them, then you follow the process of putting cheese, milk, and butter all together. The thought of it seems like a potential trip to the ER and at the very least uh, a disaster of a kitchen. But is this not us? <laughs> Dick Brogdon says, Jesus wants us to believe that it is his joy to carry us and that he delights in being our constant provider. He wants us to believe that we are not a burden to him, that it is his joy to shepherd us. He wants us to believe that our dependence on him is not irksome or displeasing, that he revels in it. He is honored by our dependence on him. God's joy is that we eternally need his supplies, and our joy is that he eternally supplies our needs. So what can we do to abide, remain, dwell, and depend on the vine? So we're just going to look at two points really quickly, very quickly. So this is just a flyover for you, but... Um, the first one is to have consistent time with Jesus. So abiding in Jesus essentially means to lavish extravagant daily time on him. This is enjoyed in two primary ways. 
We, can, we need to have a fixed set time um, every single day that is spent in Bible reading, prayer, and other things like worship, other disciplines, and then all day continual communion with Jesus. So one practical step, just one, this is a huge topic, but um, I want to leave you with tonight is the way of abiding in a breath prayer. So in the book, Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster, yes, he talks about how from the 4th to the 6th century, Christians prayed what they called breath prayers. So the idea was to spend some time in reflection in order to identify what your heart really longed for from God. What does your spirit cry out for? What are you desperate to receive from him? So the prayer was encapsulated in a short sentence of seven to nine sentence, syllables, excuse me. Even Christians, excuse me, each Christian prayed this prayer numerous times a day. They picked an event that happened frequently during the day, and every time that event occurred, they lifted up their prayer to the Lord. So initially, these prayers felt somewhat academic and dry, uh, but over the weeks and months of discipline, they became more and more natural. As months became years, the prayers moved into the subconscious levels, and people began to pray even in their sleep. So these prayers became as natural and regular as breathing. So currently, my breath prayer is, Jesus, would your name be lifted up? And I say this every time I receive a text, and it reminds me all day long that I am not God, that he alone is God, and people should be drawn to him, not to me. And so Jesus invites us to abide with him, and central to that is communing with him all day long. So breath prayers can be, help us to begin to take our eyes off ourselves and fix them on Jesus. Our relationship with Jesus is vital. All things will pass away, but Jesus never. The second thing that we're just going to quickly talk about is gratefulness. How can we abide um, in the vine is gratefulness. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So much about gratitude we, we might understand. Uh, maybe we grew up understanding that you say, Lord, thank you for this food. Um, even we have a holiday called Thanksgiving, which has turned into Turkey Day. So great. But um, do we embrace gratitude um, in our, in our day-to-day lives? So gratitude comes from the same word as freedom. When something is um, gratis, we consider it free. Uh, Ravi Zacharias says, gratitude is the freeing expression of a free heart toward one who freely gave. So one emotion of gratitude could be the one that erupts um, on the spur of a moment. It's the moment of, thank you so much for taking care of my car. Um, Thank you for doing the dishes. I, I got an A on my test, like, thank you, Lord. So all of these things are wonderful, but so often they can disappear and are replaced by other emotions of disappointment, unmet expectations, sorrow, fear. We can easily forget and then quickly replace it by an unpleasant experience that might happen. So I want to quickly try and talk about a a different kind of gratitude. Um, One that is more grateful for the giver than for the gift, for life rather than for abundance, a gratitude that values our relationship with Jesus beyond any benefits we could receive from the relationship. A.B. Simpson wrote a poem that says, Once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was the feeling, now it is his word. Once the gift I longed for, now the giver own. Once I sought for healing, now himself alone. So we need to recognize that ungratefulness is the first step away from God. When you don't receive the grade you want, or the job you wanted, or the relationship you wanted, or the healing you asked for, jealousy, comparisons, or the feelings of not being good enough can can begin to creep in. So how do we respond? Do we thank God that he's good in all circumstances, or begin to distance ourselves from God because he didn't keep his end of the bargain? Just as ungratefulness is the first step away from God, gratefulness is the first step back to God's heart. So a few weeks ago, like many of you, we went to Sacramento on a mission trip. I think there's some of you here, yes. I had expectations of greatness. Here's the thing. I've been to quite a few countries where I fainted in a bathroom in the Kenyan Sahara because I was 
really sick with the stomach virus. I fell off a camel with Katie Pitt and got a black eye. Um, I've slept in the jungles of the Philippines. I really thought, here we go. Um, Sacramento will be a breeze. So um, I imagine meeting new students on campus, enjoying the sun of California, and making an impact there. It was going to be great. Our trip started um, with a 2 a.m. wake-up call in the morning. We're about to fly out by none other than our sweet, precious Peter man. And um, this left him with five hours of sleep and then us with about two. And the flight uh, from California was, well, Matt sort of talked about that person on the flight that you all hate, but nothing short of a disaster. So um, it was, I, I could feel myself wanting to look at people and say, there is nothing I can do. I don't know what you want me to do. And then I just knew I was tired. But um, if you scream, if you hear a screaming kid, there's not a whole lot you can do. So, um, but, um, we finally land, and Peter has his first of what I will call a blowout. I will not tell you all the details of this. Um, it just involves diapers and new clothes. I think you understand this. So the next few days went something like this. We forgot our stroller in Huntsville, so we went to Target to um, buy the cheapest stroller they had. So you buy this thing called an umbrella stroller, okay? And uh, Well, we found out umbrella strollers, are, umbrella strollers are made for people under 5'8". So Matt and I are now pushing a doll stroller around everywhere. It's ridiculous. Then we go to the hotel, and then they tell us they don't have any cribs. So Matt's running to Walmart in the middle of the night buying, buying a $90 pack and play that we don't need, okay? So um, Peter went to the emergency room because he fell off the bed and he gashed his head open. The sunny California, yeah, it rains 15 days in Sacramento a year and it rains six of those while we were there. So, um, so we go on campus and Peter literally had probably 100 blowouts throughout the whole week. Um, one time on campus I could see something on his back and I'm like, I don't think that's dirt. Dang it, you know? So... <laughs> I'm like, have this kid, and I'm just like walking around to all the bathrooms, and there's no changing tables. I don't know where to go. So I asked this lady, and there is, this, there is a mother's room, but you check it out, and everybody can have it for an hour. Someone just went in there. So I have to wait a whole hour. I don't know what would you have done. Tell me. Because I don't know if I should change him on a dirty bathroom floor or um, – Anyways, I didn't, I just, I just held him, okay, for an entire hour. Um, I just sat there in complete frustration. Why does California, why, did there, why is there no changing tables? I thought that they um, cater to everyone, okay? <laughs> California, you know? Anyways, so, by, you know, I was really angry. By Wednesday, I just said, Matt, I, I can't, I can't do this. Like, I have to go to the hotel. I can't do this. This is not working. And as I sat in the hallway at the day's end, <laughs> while Peter slept in the room, in his great mercy, Jesus met with me. And he said, Hannah, you are complaining about much. You're troubled and you're toiling, you're anxious, you're straining over much. But you're missing the most important part. And that is me in these circumstances. One thing is missing. Not that everything be perfect, but that you realize that I'm providing everything you need for life and godliness. He said, look to me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so I know this story may seem trite. Um, so many of us are walking through real suffering, loss of loved ones and depression, um, hurt from people in your life. But I believe in every circumstance, Jesus wants us to learn to cultivate a heart of gratitude. This is a skill. Um, it needs to be planted in our hearts, uh, watered, taken care of, and it, we will begin to harvest gratitude in our hearts. If we begin with the small areas of our life, then in every circumstance we'll be able to praise Jesus. Some of our dear friends last, last year walked through um, the great sorrow of losing a child. And just moments after it happened, this was the overflow of their mouths. They said, we place our trust in Jesus, knowing in him all things are good. Our hurt runs deep, but in the sweet name of Jesus, we find our strength. He is never failing, our comforter and ever-present help in times of trouble. The journey ahead is tough, but we know Jesus restores what is lost and draws us near. In that moment, their grateful hearts drew them nearer to God's heart. And the mystery and the wonderful thing of it all was that Jesus was always there because he's near to the brokenhearted. So gratefulness is always the first step back to the heart of God. To end tonight, I want us to look at Luke 22. Um, it's quite a few verses, uh, but tonight is historically the night um, that Jesus would have shared the Passover meal 
with his disciples and the night that he was betrayed. And so if you'll um, follow along with me, we'll start in verse uh, 14. One moment. It says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me, with me on, at the table. The Son of Man will go. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed. But woe to that man who betrays him! They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. So how do we measure greatness? Some would say it, can be me- it can't be measured, um, it can only be felt, which I don't really understand what that means. Um, but a quick uh, Google search of who is the greatest of all time would seem, it would seem that um, they'd be measured by the amount of money one has or their influence, uh, power, success, success in their business. Currently, greatness is encompassed in how many of something um, someone owns, like homes or cars or stocks or planes or followers on social media. So does anyone know who Pele is? Or who some like to refer to as the Black Pearl? So he is widely um, regarded as the greatest soccer player of all time. He was the most successful legal um, scorer in the world. He scored 1,281 goals. He's known for his ability to strike powerful and accurate accurate shots with both feet in addition to anticipating his opponent's movements on the field. But it wasn't just about his physicality on the field, his attitude, his personality, his activism, all these contributed to the man who was Pele. So every time he made a goal, millions of people in unison would all go wild. Um, All together, one heart, screaming, worshiping, ecstatic over that goal. But that was just a moment. A few hundred experiences, and then it's done. Now, do you know who Jesus is? There were only 12 men and maybe a few hundred people at the cross. But that one seemingly insignificant moment has affected all of history, all of mankind. Those hours on the hill of Golgotha have rippled through the years. When we think back to the night of the Last Supper, the disciples were reclining with the greatest human being who would ever walk the earth. He is the founder, he was and is the founder and perfecter of their faith. He's the only one who sat at the table without sin. Um, He had just led them in a Passover meal that would be implemented for years to remember that their sins were forgiven through the true Passover lamb. And there was such grace as he answered their question about who is the greatest. Jesus showed time and time again that there is a radically different approach to greatness. He taught that the greatest people are those who serve others instead of being served, who place others' interests ahead of their own, who are living out what they say they believe, who love others, even their enemies, without expectations of how they'll be treated in return, who have a childlike faith in him, and who are humble. So in this moment, Jesus mercifully took the focus off themselves and back onto him. If the worship team will come in, um, they're going to come and lead us in a, a song And we're also going to take communion in just a minute, too. But I believe that the Lord is asking us tonight to put to death all self-will and any obstinacy that says, my way, not God's way. All self-promotion, 
all self-sufficiency, for there to be freedom from any selfish ambition, we must look to Jesus. We want to ask the Holy Spirit tonight to search and sift our hearts and bring us to the end of our self-dependence. If you're here tonight and you haven't fully surrendered your life to Jesus, um, making him your Lord and Savior, he is here longing for you to become a child of God. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God in eternity looked upon us, foreseeing our faults, our brokenness, our pride, and our sin, and still said, I want them in my family. I want you in my family. Jesus came for you, and he came for me. He said, I will do anything for them to be a part of my family. I'll pay for them with my son's life. Why? Because he loves you so much and finds you worth it. So the question tonight is, do we want to walk with Jesus? Do you want to walk with Jesus? If you've been around but haven't fully surrendered your life to him, I want you to know he's the most faithful, wonderful, qualified, um, worthy Lord and Savior and friend that you could ever have. And we are made to know him and have a relationship with him. So Jesus wants to meet each and every one of us tonight. I want to pray over us. And as I pray, I want you to come down um, to the altar and find a place to meet with God. Um, you can bring your small group leader or someone to pray with. There will also be people up here to pray with you. But tonight, um, Jesus wants to meet with you. So let me just pray. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We love you, God. We're so grateful for you, Jesus. We look to you, God. Thank you, Lord. Um, thank you that you call us friends, that you, um, that you came, Jesus, that you, um, you died on the cross and you've forgiven our sins, Lord, so that we can know you and be in relationship with you, Jesus. We lift you high tonight, Jesus. Lord, we just pray tonight, Holy Spirit, that you would search and sift our hearts. God, the areas that we hold on to and say that I have to run my life, you don't understand, this is, this is what I have to do, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to open our hands to you, Jesus, to trust that you're good. God, you are good and you are faithful. Would we yield our life to you, Jesus? Lord, we love you. We, we remember who you are. God, we thank you for tonight. It is such a celebration. It's a celebration to... Um, to remember what you did for us. And, um, and Lord, so I just pray that tonight, Lord, if there's anybody in this room who for the last several months have been around, who've, who've heard, who've, um, who are in, who are out, God, I just pray that tonight, Lord, you have been pursuing them your in, their entire life, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that tonight they would say yes fully surrendering their life and walking with you, Jesus. We love you, God. We pray that you would be magnified. Would you be lifted high? So we'd love to invite you if you'd like to give your heart to Jesus tonight for the first time or if you're wanting to come and to repent and to give your life back to Jesus. We'd love to invite you to come and find a place at the altar or someone to pray with. And for those of you that are walking with Jesus, 